ahead and get started. And if some other folks come in, that'll just be beneficial. I will turn it over to you, Peter. Thank you Great. so much for being here today to help us with this. Yes, of course. Welcome, everybody. So yes, we're specifically focusing on lighting and getting the best lighting situations out of your locations, whether they are indoor or outdoor. And there are a few things that if you can keep them in mind, they will make your life much better and they will make the films turn out much better as well. So I am recording this for those uh, who are, can't be here or uh, to reflect back on and uh, uh, remember what may have been said. Okay, so I hope to also add some specific questions about a location that you know you need to shoot or you know you've seen in the storyboards or you heard them talking about it in a production meeting and you're trying to figure out, well, how can we light, how can we get the best image out of that location? So if you come up with things like, you know you were gonna shoot somewhere and how could you fix that? Uh, I'll allow for some questions there to really pinpoint how to fix something. Um, just looking at our screens here and looking at a lighting setup, um, where, where do you see lighting that works well and where do you see lighting that would be a problem in shooting a video? Yes, Mason. Um, I, well, my lighting. Yeah, I was gonna say. My lighting is not great. Yes, so Mason's lighting is not great. And then okay. which are the better lighting setups? Uh, both of the Charlottes have a great, well, Charlotte uh, Wheeler's on the left, it's kind of heavy on the right, not on the left. So like you can see half of her face, you can't see the other, but Charlotte Walbert has a great, you can see her entire face and you can see everything in the background. Yes, but both of them are very interesting lighting setups. Charlotte Wheeler's got much mm -hmm. more dramatic lighting going on. You've got these great shadows on half of her face, but half of her face is pretty well lit with this beautiful side light. Behind her is this really interesting geometry going on with the light as well. It might be a little distracting in terms of pulling the focus to that really bright spot on the wall, but in terms of the, the angles of the shadows behind her, they are really interesting. Um, Charlotte Walber's got really nice lighting that is even. The background is a little more dim than where she is. So there is, the, the focus is pulled to your subject. Um, Rosie has some good lighting because that, that architectural lighting behind her, the practical lighting of the, the house lights, not necessarily the work lights so much, um, but her face is very well lit. There are these dark areas behind her. It's generally a little more dim because she is pulling that focus. So you want to really emphasize where you want the audience to look with lighting. You want the most important part of that shot to be kind of the focus of that light, to pick up the most light. And sometimes that's dimming things down, kind of shading some areas. If you want someone's hand, because they're giving someone the red and the blue pill, you want those to be in the focus of the light. So I would want to kind of shade my own self if I wanted my hands and those pills to be right there in the focus of the light. So consider that when you're telling the story, when you're reading the script, and when you're thinking, when you're looking at the storyboards, what is the most important part of the frame? What is the most important part of the story right then that you want to emphasize a little bit with light? And it doesn't have to be a super bright spotlight that you are like, demanding your audience to look right here, but it's very subtle sometimes of just having a little more shadow or a little more shade over part of the subject where the focus is brought down to a different part of the frame, okay? We're so used to seeing things in these really small frames. I want you to try to imagine that everything you're shooting is gonna be on a big, huge movie screen because there's a potential that it may get projected onto a larger surface. So you do want to consider that if you move something, a focus from one side of the screen to the other side of the screen, that could be your audience turning their full head to look at something. So you really want to look in your storyboards as where is the focus moving in your, screen, in your shots between from one shot to another. 
Is it really bouncing from one side of the screen to the other? Because that can get uncomfortable, which might be perfect for that sense of tone, right? So lighting and composition is going to really help tell the story and direct your audience as to where they want to look, okay? We do it a lot in theater too, in terms of lighting. Where do you want to look? You can emphasize and, and localize that lighting. You can change the color of everything else and have an emphasis color in where you want them to look, where the action is happening. So it's the same thing in film. You really want to emphasize with light and tell the story with light. Okay, um, Peter? Yes. I have a question. So um, I understand that a part of the job is like the composition, but what if I, I'm kind of confused because like the directors have already storyboarded? Yes. Um, so I don't want to like go against like the storyboards. No, and that's part of the production meeting process where you look at the initial storyboards and then it gets finessed a little bit. Um, if the director hasn't seen the exact location and you have, you may have more information about, it would be in terms of where the sun is, we kind of need to shoot it at a different angle than this. Or that's a nice, uh, we have it framed in the door and we're looking right at the door, but it, wouldn't it be much more interesting if that door had more depth to it and we shot it at a different angle rather than just straight on as a door. So the storyboards can definitely get finessed and then a lot of times that happens on location where you're looking at the original storyboard and then you're looking at the location and you realize, oh, this would be much better if we do it actually from this angle and look at it from here instead. Yeah, so um, you just want to use the expertise that you're getting right now to make offers to the director. And they don't even have to take every single one of them, but some of them they might take, especially for shooting outdoors and on location. And you and Ruby like look at that location and you go, you know what, we either need to shoot between eight and 10 in the morning or between 4 p.m. and five at night because those are when we're getting some of the best lighting. So we need to actually just figure out the logistics to make sure that we shoot where we get that outdoor lighting that actually complements this, this location the best. So it's, it's just making those offers and, and, you, and that's, that's, that's what you're doing here so that you can give that, those, those offers and those suggestions to the directors because you're here to help the things that they've already figured out and the decisions they've already made. And then you're there to be like, oh, you know what would be even better is if we did X. And most of it has to do with the tone and the emotions that are going on in the scene and how to best get those across. Uh, how there, there's outdoor lighting and there's indoor lighting. Let's start with outdoor lighting and figuring out how best to use the sun because that is your single brightest light source that you'll ever be able to find and afford. Um, and it is extremely useful. It can be something that you battle against so instead, we want to look at how can we best use the sun. Most of the time, you've got three lights that you're looking at. The key light, which is the, mo the brightest light that is emphasizing your subject. There's a fill light that's going to kind of fill in some of the shadows. And then there's a backlight that might separate you from the background. Or it might just give a glow. It might silhouette you. It's something that it really uh, helps um, give much more depth to that image. So those are the three what lights was the second one again? you're aiming for. The key light, the fill light, because it fills in those shadows, and the back light. Thank you. So that's what we call three-point lighting. You don't always need them, but, uh, and depending on the, the style and the tone that you're going for, you may not want much fill if you want some really dramatic shadows going on. Or you might want a harder backlight and then just a little bit of fill if you really want that mystery and knowing who that is. Charlotte is demonstrating a way to fill, not using another light, but actually bouncing the light. So that is one of your biggest resources in outdoor lighting is being able to bounce that light. And you can use anything from a piece of paper that is white, uh, ideally if it's on a harder surface, so you can just kind of control 
that as a bounce, a, a wider bounce of light. You could use a mirror and it will create another sun. <laughs> and that could actually create a key light. If you bounce the sun with a mirror, you can bounce it with a piece of wood that is white or gray, depending on how much light you want it to bounce. And then you can also get, uh, these are called reflectors. This is a five in one reflector, which has a white bounce surface on one side, a gold bounce surface, which creates a much warmer light that is bounced. And then if you unzip this, you can create, it has three more surfaces. This cover can flip inside out and it has a silver bounce. Uh, the other side has a black, which is more like a flag and helps create shadow or shade. So that can block some of the light. And then if you don't have any covering on this at all, you can see through it, right? So this is called a diffuser. This diffuses that light as if there's a layer of fog over the sun. This will diffuse that light and create a much softer light. So when you think about qualities of light, you have a hard light and a soft light. Right now I'm hit, getting hit from fairly hard light and you can see lines of shadows on my face. But if you were instead to diffuse that light, if I were standing under this, Notice how that evens out everything of the light and it's a much softer quality of light. It gives you a whole different tone than this, right? It's also a little more attractive of lighting. <laughs> I think I look better in this light than I do in this light. Yeah, and like, can I jump in Peter really yeah. fast? So like one of the one of the things that he talked about with shadows and making those shadows um, not so not so harsh and making it more even. But the other thing that um, a softer light will do is the shininess of the actor's skin will become will become less less shiny. It will require a little less makeup and also some of the some of the features um, on someone's face, such as wrinkles or 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 things like that are get they're a little harder to see you get you get you kind of you can kind of like kind of do like a really quick and dirty makeup job just by diffusing and making your light a little softer yeah and so that that can be a really really helpful thing especially if we're going to be shooting outside and the sun is going to be really really helpful for us but often you don't want direct sunlight direct harsh sunlight especially not right from overhead yeah so that overhead noontime light, go ahead, Roya. Oh, um, well, when you were talking about using the diffuser to have a softer light, I was thinking about last year and how with uh, psych lights, you can use gels and then put a diffuser over or under it. And so I was just kind of thinking like, is it possible to use that diffuser gel combination or rather is it recommended in film? We often like, do it. Uh, okay. That's usually when we have lighting instruments that we're using. And mm -hmm. in the film, they'll have clothespins and gels put over top of their lights. Uh, you'll see they've got these barn doors over the lights and then they clip the gels so that they're in front of those lights. Um, those lights get extremely hot and they'll melt those gels. So they have to keep them further out than we usually do in the theater. Um, the, uh, they'll also bounce light. So they'll have a super bright light up against a white surface and then hitting the actors. And that really softens the light. And we don't do that nearly as much in theater because we don't have the control of the frame. Whereas we can have, you know, this can be just outside of the frame and be bouncing a really beautiful light on top of me. Whereas everything needs to fit on the stage and is either visible by the audience or not visible by the audience in theater. Whereas film, you can have things like a microphone can be just outside of that frame and it can be picking up really good audio or the same thing with a light source or a bounce of that light. Um, there, what can we use to diffuse that light if we're outdoors? Yeah, Danny, or is that a question? Uh, that was a question. Um, I was just wondering, uh, so I'm doing costumes for a couple shows. Um, and I was kind of wondering a little bit about how, uh, like, sunlight 
as opposed to theater light would affect like what's the differences there and what are the nuances there uh especially when it relates to costumes but if that's not the topic we're on we don't have to talk about it right now in terms of sunlight you and this is about everything else and what charlotte was just talking about skin is that reflectivity uh your costumes if they have a reflective quality to them it's going to be much more intense under that sunlight mm -hmm. so you especially really if they're pretty it's that. cold mm -hmm. yeah. oh yeah are you doing uh is there a gold statue um that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where you may not need to get, or you want to be super conscious of, is it direct light hitting it? Or should we bounce that light instead? Can we put something over top to really keep it uh, diffused instead? Or you wait for a foggy day and you got to shoot in the fog. But we don't usually have that luxury. <laughs> instead, we create fog. Um, what can you use to help diffuse light other than clouds in a foggy day, which work really well? A tree? Well, no. A tree can create the shade, and sometimes it creates this beautiful dappled light, which can be super useful. Yes? Fabric. Fabric. Fabric is extremely helpful. Uh, affordable. What's even better are shower screens that are uh, semi-transparent, right? So they really diffuse the light. Shower curtains are extremely useful in front of windows to help diffuse the harsh light coming in from a window and really even out that lighting. Um, and you can also bounce light off of them so they could be used to diffuse or bounce that light. Um, so shower curtains would be a really good investment for the company to buy a few and have them available. Um, these five-in-one reflectors and their diffusion are extremely useful and only about 30 bucks each. Um, and it's better to have a bigger one if you have a two-person scene. I sit it on top of my head. Um, this single, this one is 40 centimeters or so, so this one's great for just a one person. Um, but it creates a lot of bounce for a scene as well. Uh, I, I'm, bouncing light, excuse me, will create a different quality of light. If you're sitting next, if your scene takes place next to water, you might want that reflected kind of light coming up from water. So you can actually bounce light off of water, a pan of water. It helps to have some tin foil in the bottom of that pan as well to help reflect that light. Uh, tin foil alone, um, insulation foam that has a metallic, a, a, a silver side to it is super useful. You can pick up at Home Depot some insulation, hard insulation foam that is actually silver colored on one side, oftentimes on the other side it's white. Or if it's pink foam, you can paint it white. So those would be super useful. They're lightweight and they're easy to manipulate that light. Um, you can bounce light to create a backlight. You can use the sun as a backlight and then bounce that sunlight back at your actor so that they have this beautiful glow, but we can still see them. They're not completely in silhouette. So that's bouncing light is going to be your best friend. So having access to fabric, having access to uh, white foam core or just cardboard painted white, or I have a piece of uh, Luan painted white that is just kind of always in the car. Um, and even just small pieces for the close-ups, small pieces will help really bounce that light. And just like just like I did in, in this example, where I'm just I'm just holding the notebook for some of the shots, since a lot of the actors might be filming themselves, and that ca the camera that they're shooting with is just going to be on a tripod. You can just ask them to just hold something in their hand and be like, "Okay, just move it here so that it's right out of the shot, but it's bouncing that light right back up at your face." So there might be just so a lot of this is just going to be actually because we have to social distance, and the actors are going to be filming themselves of trying to create some sort of setup, 
that they can recreate so we can reshoot there again. Because maybe you plan the whole lighting setup without the director there. And then you have to put it back together so the director can see it and be like, yes, it's great. It's wonderful. We like it. And then you have to recreate it again for shooting day. So it needs to be, you want to just use all this, the simple tricks and some of the things that already exist in someone's house of like, if I just change the angle, we can just bounce that light right off of that wall if we put you closer towards the corner or, or whatever. So, so sometimes little simple things that an actor can just hold, if, as long as you shine the light right at it, might be really, really helpful. And just think, just think in terms of, of that you've got an actor by themselves in, the, in their room and how you can position them and, and help them with the things that already exist in their room or just bringing them simple and lightweight um, augmentary you know, elements. Like you might have to bring them a reflector or you might have to bring them an extra light LED light instrument because we do have a few things like that. We might have to bring them a tripod so that they can mount their phone up. So that's, that's a lot of the things that you're trying to help the director do that's off of rehearsal time. And that's the reason that you're trying to get this expertise so that the director can be like, I like the room that they're in, but it's too dark or the light is too harsh or it's too weird. And then you're, you're gonna set up a little meeting time, you know, or, you know, with them to try to just be like, tweak everything to make it so it'll look great. Not only for this shot, but for the shots on either side of it. So that you have a nice seamless mm -hmm. light between, between takes. Right. Uh, those white curtains that are behind you, Liam, those are really great for diffusing the light as well. And oftentimes someone will have some sort of curtains uh, or blinds that they can use to help adjust the light that's coming into a room. Um, let's stick to outdoor lighting though still. I have a couple other things. I need to run grab a flashlight. So think about other light sources that are simple and handheld. Most of the time we're not, hopefully, we're not doing a lot of wide shot, full body shots that we're actually keeping things a little more tight in the storyboards. I haven't really been looking at them yet. Um, but uh, let me grab a flashlight quickly. Ah, so frustrating. Of course, the batteries are dead in this flashlight, so those aren't going to work. But here I have a very simple, um, not too simple. This one's actually more complicated, but this is a video light source. I think they bought one similar to this for- I'm uh, pretty sure company. we have that, ex that exact one. Great, yeah, this is a really fantastic source. Uh, phone lights work pretty well as well for an uptight, uh, an uptight, an up, <laughs> a close up shot. But this light source works really well What's unique about this one is that you can control not only the intensity of the light, but also the quality of the light. So uh, intensity, it goes really pretty bright as well, but it can also change its uh, color temperature. So it can get much more warm or cool. So this is just trying to match a quality of light. Sunlight is different than the light that we use in the theaters. So sorry, was that, sorry what, what kind of light was that called? What's the this name? This is called a roto light. Roto light? That's okay. the brand of it, but it's just a video light source. So it's like the ring lights and other light sources that we've been investing in for zooming. Um, but this one allows you to adjust the color temperature and the intensity. Uh, and the color temperature goes from the 34, the low 3000s, which is a warmer light. I don't know if you can really kind of tell this, but it's, it's warmer, it's more orange. And it's a lot more like the lights we use indoors and the tungsten lights that we have in the theater. And then they go up to, uh, this one goes up to 6,300. Daylight is 5,600. 
So daylight actually has a lot, well, no, not anymore. Now we're running it through smoke. So now it is much lower. That orange day that we had, that was probably in the 1200s in terms of t color temperature. It was so orange. And did you notice that when you were out, if you went out at all, but light from other, from houses and windows and cars even, the, the other lights looked so blue white against this orange backdrop. Everything else stood out as such a different color of light where usually we're trying to match the daylight, which is super bright. It, it hasn't been the same for the past week and a half or so because it's got so much, uh, it's got a gel in front of it of smoke. <laughs> so it is, it's crazy. Um, so yeah, the smoke that's outdoors is gonna affect your shoots. Yeah, for sure. Yay. Uh, but Peter, can you talk a little bit more about color temperature? Because especially if there's, um, uh, something that's already been picked, like a location where the director's been rehearsing and they're like, this actor already looks great. We already like this room. We already like the lighting. And then you have to do the scene that comes right after it. Especially like, I, I think that Ben did buy or at least is willing to buy a, um, a light meter. But even if we don't, could you talk about some tricks for trying to match color temperature? Yeah. Most of the time you see this when there is a light coming from outside, there's a natural light coming in through a window and then they have uh, a desk lamp or they have other lights in the house and the color looks really strange. Most of the time we are trying to match those color temperatures so that the light actually looks the same. Um, daylight again is, is usually much brighter and then we use these fluorescents or we use these LEDs or, or CFLs, these indoor lights that are much, uh, much different, much wider instead of the, the warmth of sunlight. Um, so oftentimes we're just trying to balance that. I don't even see it too much in our shots right here. You're using a lot of natural light in your shots right now um, and not so much extra light. Charlotte Walber, do you have an extra light on your face or is that another window? No, there's two windows yeah. over there. Yeah, exactly. So that's why everything matches so well, because none of you are really using artificial light. Um, I kind of have like a bounce off of light. There's a window over here. And then I'm, I don't know if this is just me hallucinating, but I do have a blue wall right here. Yeah. The light right here on this cheek is a, t is a kind of different than the light right here. Exactly. So that's another thing about where they are standing and what color the wall is that they're standing near. If it has a deep color to it, it's going to reflect that. Red walls, blue walls are going to reflect a lot of that color back onto your actor. Um, so that really needs to uh, keep in mind when you're working on locations or in a house that has an accent wall or something that the light is bouncing off of. Might be really useful or it might suddenly make that scene look so different than the other scenes on either side of it. And since we're stitching together these scenes and we don't have one like camera operator who's gonna be making sure that the lighting is even between these scenes, we need to try to plan ahead as much as possible to, to keep that. Otherwise we're left at the computer trying to even out the coloring between the scenes and that gets really difficult. Um, so things you wanna look for are, are we going to use as much natural light in these locations as possible? Indoors, many locations have a lot of windows. We live in California where we tend to have a lot of windows um, and not so many basements. Uh, and then, or are there so many locations that they're gonna be using artificial light? So if you can even that out just by what your locations are and they'll be using natural light or, or uh, artificial light, then you can easily kind of even those out. We're then figuring out, well, this one is going to need a lot more natural looking light. So you're either gonna try to bounce the light from a window to hit them, or you're gonna need to look at a lighting source that can mimic that natural light where you can adjust the tone of it. There are gels that adjust the tone of the light and they go specifically from tungsten light 
to a daylight source, right? Um, and so those gels can be used in front of a, uh, whether it's a theater light or whether it's a, a work light, a clip light, you can turn a clip light into looking much more like daylight by putting a gel on it. Um, so that's the first thing you need to look at is like in these different scenes, where are they going to be shot? And you need to look, you need to see these in a zoom and really try to match them. That would kind of be ideal if in one zoom, you could get all of the locations on one and even take a screenshot of it and go, okay, what is the different qualities of lights in these rooms from about the angle that you think you're going to be shooting them from? So that would be a, a really brilliant thing that I don't know if they've done that in, <laughs> in the real I world before. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know if anyone has, but that sounds like a really great idea. <laughs> it and maybe sounds brilliant. Could, you could, Cause you could at least set up the different shots that are gonna be right next to each other. This shot's gonna be in this location, yeah. right next to this one, right next to this one, right next to this one. And then if you did get everybody on a Zoom, you could just visually just make sure that everything's pretty seamless between those, between those ones. Yeah, so you That's might- That's a really good idea. There are, there are situations in a script where you don't want the scenes to look alike. There are good guys and bad guys. The bad guy scenes might want to use color to kind of emphasize something about them. So you may want to bounce some red light on them, or you may want to have a, a red light that is in the background somewhere. You may want to kind of emphasize that evil quality of them with our stereotypical red light goes evil for us, or it's love, because love is evil. Um, but. <laughs> But there are certain, there's that red quality of light, it, we recognize as, oh, that's something bad's going to happen, right? Um, or, oh, they're in love. I guess that's more pinkish, rosy color versus there is that deep evil red color. Um, good guys might need much more brighter lighting, right? When you're in a scene that, that is just full of energy, think about as getting as much light in there as possible or mysterious scenes, scenes where you don't know what's coming, scenes where the character is um, contemplating whether they're going to make this decision or not. That's where you wanna focus in the light and make it all dark and just one single light source. Um, Danny. How would you do that during daytime? Also, has my mic been on this entire time? I think so, but I haven't heard anything. I've been yabbering on, so. Um, daytime, single source light. If you're outdoors, that is definitely a little more difficult, but then you're looking for overhangs, you're looking for getting in the shadow and adding a light source. And that's where it's brilliant. And then you're thinking about the angle of the light. Uh, let me actually turn off my lights. If you're indoors, shut down windows, block windows, block light, turn off all the lights, and then you start sculpting with the light. You start adding one light source and seeing what does that do? Bounce that light and see what that does. Let me turn off these lights here. So I do have some light streaming in through windows over here. I have light from the computer screen, but for the most part, I can sculpt this with just one light. So I have this light, really intense and bright. Let's turn that down. So it still seems super bright, right? So what do you do to try to minimize that? Right now it is hitting me directly. I wanna see if I can bounce that light. I have a notebook here. I'm gonna open up a notebook to find a bright white page of light. So instead of shining the light directly at me, I'm gonna bounce that light onto the notebook instead. And then I'm gonna angle that notebook. It's sitting in my lap. I'm just bouncing that light. Okay, under light. What do we tend to see? What does this kind of light do to a character? 
is this really happy? Am I a good guy in this light? It's very foreboding. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say ominous, but yeah. It is ominous. So you get these shadows, especially with glasses. I always love the, the glasses that create these eyebrows. I'm like, wow. Right? So underlighting can really create a specific tone and mood. Glasses are difficult. You're going to get weird reflections in glasses. It's very difficult to get rid of that without a polarizing filter on the camera. Uh, and there are some DIY ways to do that. If we had 3D glasses from the movie theater, you can use those two lenses and they work as a polarizing filter and they get rid of reflection. Okay, so there's underlight. If I do, if I can hold this above my head and bounce that light from above. So you, you wanna, we generally don't try to here, trying to keep it out of the camera as well. Okay, so I'm kind of bouncing that light from above me in front. So that's a much more even lighting. I'm going to move the bounce over here. Uh, if I can, I got, I need three more arms. So it will get really tricky if one person is trying to light and film themselves. <laughs> if they can't set things up in some way in their location or have help from someone to hold something. Do we yeah, have so, stands? Well, some, some of the actors are good, will, might have help because they might have family members who could help and maybe yeah. just hold something in place. But if, um, if they don't have that resource, it just means it's gonna take a hot second to set it up. Meaning it can't get done right the second before it's supposed to get shot. It need, you need to make that, make that appointment and make, that, make time to go to those rehearsals and do it outside of the rehearsal time with the directors, possibly. Maybe the directors really want to be there because it's really important. But like, it's going to take some time to set it up and figure out what it wants to be. So like, because Peter doesn't have three arms, um, we're, we're going to have to figure out if like, oh, if that bounce needs to be here, we maybe need to like, we, maybe do we have something we can drape a sheet on where we can get this angle of this light to, in order to act as the bounce for that exactly. or drape that shower court curtain or whatever. So this is just a really good example that it just, it's going to take a few minutes. You want to give it some time and hopefully some time before the day of shooting is scheduled. Some, some time needs to get scheduled where you can go and look at, look at those setups and see what they look like and make those improvements and those tweaks that you need to. Um, to get it to get it where you want it to be. So this, as I'm, I'm working hard for this one. Okay, this is I'm trying to hold the balance up at about 45 degrees up and over from my face. So it creates this triangle of shadow on the other side of my nose. This is called Rembrandt lighting. The artist, um, and this is kind of more natural light. This is what we think about as natural lighting when it's coming from about a 45 degree angle. It's generally kind of attractive. It's, the, it's, a, it's a good lighting look. It's fairly even, but it's got some shadow and depth to it. So it's not the even lighting that kind of minimizes the shadows if it's in front of me. Oh, my arms. <laughs> and then I could also try, oh, this is gonna be even more difficult. I think I'd have to have this behind me as well. So, <laughs> nope. Uh, I'm trying to get a backlight going on. If I can get a little bit of glow from behind me, but it's not in the, sh in the camera and blinding the camera. But this is kind of a backlight, a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a glow. I just can't, I can't really set it up with holding this light. Um, but a backlight, oops, here we go. Backlight's gonna give you that glow, that rim light around a shoulder and a head. And then if I were able to bounce that 
it could create that glow, but also give me a little bit of light on my face. Uh, oh, there it is. That's not too bad. That's a little better. Um, but this is me with two hands, one light, <laughs> and a balance, right? So you want to play with that in locations or specific scenes that are um, uh, significant or they're not natural, right? When you're trying to create a very specific look or tone to this character, you might really want to go for that hard under lighting for a very dramatic effect of <laughs> right? There might be a certain moment when that is great and fun, right? Um, or you just might need to soften that instead of that hard light and bounce, bounce that under lighting instead so it doesn't totally take over and blow out uh, their skin tone or something. <laughs> And then sometimes it's how the actor is facing that light. So sometimes you might need them to adjust their positioning as well. Um, and it's going to be really interesting dealing with all of these remotely by directing them from what they look like on the Zoom and saying, yes, just like that. <laughs> if you can also put your camera down there and and shoot this with your phone. And, and Peter, can you do me a favor? Can you shine that light right at the camera for a second? You see how that starts to look really awful? Just keeping your light source out of your shot is gonna be really important because it puts that glare on it and it makes Peter look grainy and, and hard to look at. Yeah. Keeping that glare and that light source just out of your frame is super important, especially when you're doing back and side light. Those are going to be the ones that are going to be wanting to get into that camera frame the most. And sometimes what it needs is, this is me with part of, my hand is covering part of the light and I'm shielding it from hitting the, the computer screen. And then if I move my hand away, you can see it's got this glow on this side, but I can really clean it up if I just block that light with a piece of paper or, or my hand or something. Just have, have any of you that. worked in lighting at, at CTE and put in the shutters on, on those lighting instruments? So yeah, that, that's exactly what those shutters do. They're like, oh, that light is spilling and glaring off and shining onto a thing we don't want to shine it on. And then you bring that shutter in and it does that. That's exactly what this is. It's just exterior. It's on the outside of the light. You just want to cover up that little bit of the light that's getting glare where you don't want it. And that's what those barn doors are that, that Peter was talking about before. That's like physical barn doors that um they're just they're just four little doors that actually go around the instrument to just to just make sure it doesn't glare and, sh and flare off in directions you don't want it to. Um, but you could use anything for that. You could use a book for that. You could use um, you know, put up a piece of you know, move a piece of furniture that'll just block that bit of light. So you get the light shining on the at, on the subject at the angle you want, but you block that flare from getting into that camera lens and, and, and lighting it up. Uh, I mean, I've got that same light hitting me directly, but I've got it further away from me. So that's helping. Sometimes you wanna, you use the light, but then you end up lighting something in the background. You're like, oh, I don't want that showing. I wanted that nice, clean black background. Or you don't wanna, it's bouncing off of, um, uh, a uh, wall thermostat or something you're like oh now I'm seeing the wall thermostat uh, and that can be just flagging that light get a piece of cardboard tape it to that light <laughs> for that moment while it so it doesn't hit where you don't want it to hit and just make sure that you're not advising the actors to do anything that will start a fire yes if yes. that light is hot don't put anything flammable near it figure out a different solution especially clip lights, anything with a light bulb that gets really hot. LED lights do not get hot, but still always be careful with lighting sources. Uh, be careful with the sun. <laughs> Oftentimes your sunlight, you're gonna say, okay, I need my actors to really face that sun. But then you've got your actors kind of like squinting and, and, and they're not looking as good because they're having to look at the sun. 
So then you turn them some, you bounce that sunlight instead of having them directly in the sun. Uh, what am I thinking of next? If you look through, I have given, uh, I've shared this huge list of resources um, on Canvas. And there are a few that are, that have asterisks in front of them that are super useful for lighting. One is called Telling the Story with Light. And that talks about and gives some really great examples of emphasizing things with light, of using color with light, uh, and choosing how to tell that story using your lighting. Uh, the other one is shaping with light, and that's talking about the angles that you're trying to light with, whether you're bouncing, you're talking about quality of light as well. Um, there's another one right after that called Lighting with Sunlight, Difficult Outdoor Shots. It has some brilliant examples of using the sun as a backlight, of how to bounce that light, of, of splitting your actor in half. Well, not the actor, I guess. Um, but splitting them with light where they're, they're getting hit by sun in, on this half, and then we have a nice shadow on this side. Or you bounce that light to help fill it a little bit. But sometimes that dramatic effect of it being uh, later in the day, early in the morning, and you've got a low angle of light that makes a really nice split down the middle. Sometimes uh, it is a really nice dramatic effect to use the sun as a backlight. You've got the camera on the opposite side. Here's the sun, here's the camera. And we have them silhouetted with this beautiful glow. You could be bouncing some of that back to them. And then maybe you catch a little bit of lens flare as they duck in and out occasionally. Depending on if this is a secretive scene and you kind of want to uh, keep it mysterious, uh, they're talking about something they don't want other people to hear, and you can use that kind of almost blinding with a little lens flare here and there of the sun being in the shot that keeps that mystery going. They're mostly in shadow. It keeps that mysterious look to them. Um, so you got to think about what is the story telling? What is the character? What's their situation that they're in? And then what is that quality that you want that scene to be shot in? Okay. And then we go back to the big giant house party that's happening and everybody's really well lit and everything. Uh, there's... And then the other ones that I added were about editing, um, but we're talking mostly about lighting today, right? Yeah. And um, the, the recording of the week workshop that Peter did before where he goes into a lot more detail of different film terminology, all of that should be on your production folders and also access to his whole Canvas lesson with all of these things broken out. Um, and if anybody has, has not found those items or can't find those links, just reach out to me or your stage management team and we should be able to point you in the right direction or, or whoever your department lead is. But Peter's been giving us a lot of great resources. If anyone wasn't able to make that previous um, workshop, that is available, that recording is available and all of his Canvas lesson. It's really, really, really great stuff. And if for anything you need more detail on, he has a little section on it and he has external resources on it. So that stuff is all available to you. And I really suggest you take some time to read through it, especially anything that you're even just curious about or that seems to affect your department and what you're working on. Great. So any, what questions do you have about the shows you know you are working on or the scripts you've read, the storyboard elements that you've seen or the locations you've been thinking about? What questions do you have about that? Do we, uh, yeah, sure. I, I have one that I'm just, I'm just not quite equipped to um, advise the kids on very well. We are doing, um, this first show that we're doing, we're shooting, we have an entire miniature set that we model, need to yeah. build and kind of the design as it's been developing that the directors and that our art directors have been working on is kind of making a, a paper theater. A lot of our small miniatures are actually gonna be two dimensional. Okay. But there's actually going to be layers of two-dimensional things in the same shot, but it's still all going to be quite small. Yeah. So A, yeah. how to shoot very small and close up, especially on some of these um, lower quality cameras that we're going to be working with. 
and also how to, on the lower quality cameras, how to get things into focus that you want in focus because we're gonna have very not three dimensional, but two dimensional items in different depths of field. Yeah. And mm -hmm. how to light that and how to help focus that in cameras. Yeah. So cameras, your biggest asset is going to be your phone cameras because it can get into places that a big DSLR camera can't fit into. So being able to slide your phone down into it. You may need to rotate things later or crop things differently if you can only get it in in portrait, not in landscape. <laughs> um, but remember that, please shoot in landscape, shoot wide. Don't shoot like we're not shooting TikToks. Why, um, why, is, that, why is that important? Can you emphasize why that's important? Aspect ratio. See, we've got- What's Mason. aspect ratio? What is aspect. that? It's the, the frame that we're looking at. Mason and Rosie, we've got in uh, portrait mode. So we've got these black bars on either side of them. What would we fill that with? What would we put on? I have no, I don't know. And, and it doesn't fill the frame that we're doing. Turn those things on their sides and we're filling that frame. Um, the frame that we're editing in, here we go. Uh, even that gives us some weird bars on the sides. But we want to make sure that all of the footage that we're working with is, is actually filling that frame. Um, a lot, some of our newer cameras are able to shoot what's called 4K, uh, and that creates a much bigger image with more information, which would allow us to zoom in and crop out and get the framing that we want. Okay, so you may want to shoot that miniature in 4K so that you can zoom in without losing quality. And you can crop out a bunch of stuff you don't want in that shot. So you could shoot it from a little further away, or you could uh, even play with, with all that information. You can then kind of, um, you can blur out your background a little bit and choose sections that you want to keep in focus. You can kind of fake your depth of field. Um, the new Apple cameras, they have this portrait mode that does that. It, it blurs everything out except for your subject. It tries to figure out, oh, there's, there's the subject. I'll blur everything else out. So you, we could do some in editing of trying to fake that. That would take a lot of time, though. That takes a lot of editing time <laughs> to do that kind of uh, work. Um, but you want a small camera, a tiny camera that you can fit in there, which is going to be a phone. Uh, if it's going to be an iPhone, if, you, if it can be set to shoot in 4K, I think I can do that with an iPhone 7 and above. Uh, the Androids, I don't know their cameras. I know those Pixel, the Google Pixels, I think, have good cameras. There are certain phones that have, they put their emphasis on their cameras. So see if you can find the cameras that can shoot in 4K, because that will give you so much more available availability of cropping and um, being able to shoot from a little further distance away and be able to zoom into it. Uh, Rosie's getting a charger, okay. Um, in terms of lighting, you, it's, it's an outdoor model, right? It's, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a village or whatever. It's a town square, right? So you gotta track where is the sun in that town. So you need a north, a south, east, west. You need a, whatever that's called, a direction. A compass. A compass, yeah. You need the compass. You need, to, you need that written, printed on that thing so it's always the same, right? So, and, all, and track your east to west, track your time of day in those scenes and where those shadows should be on that model. Um, you're not, if you're gonna have multiple light sources on that model, one needs to be the sun and any other light source should be coming from windows or street lamps or something else that is in the model. Because you're not gonna have a giant with a flashlight in this town, I don't think. It's the sun. <laughs> well, there is a one story with a giant, so there's possibilities. Oh, there we go, the story, the, the, Where the giant, giant could be holding a, torch, the lantern. a lantern. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So that, 
that's there's some possibilities there. Exactly. So you, you got extra just lighting for that story. Where would light be coming from in the story for shooting that model? And so mostly it's going to be time of day. Where is that sun going to be? Um, and being kind of religious about no, this is a this is a 4 p.m. shot. We we got to remember the sun is right there. And then when you zoom in and you're, you've got your real, your 3D, your live action shots, if they're moving from that same thing, you wanna consider the angle of light. Um, if you just shot that statue and it was 6 p.m. and then we just saw him and the light was coming from this side, you don't want how I'm lit right now. You need to make sure your light source comes from that side as well. Um, so that's a, just a continuity thing that will help uh, keep things seamless as we go from scene to scene or from a wide angle to a zoomed in and now we're live action. That, does everybody know what, we, what Peter means when he says continuity? So continuity is those weird little Easter eggs we find in movies where there was a cup of coffee and then in that next shot, that cup of coffee is gone or it's suddenly in their hand. Um, so we wanna keep that continuity. Sometimes it's just in the lighting of going from daytime and now it's really dark right behind him. And then it goes back to being bright behind them. So it's that smooth, yeah. even transitions between shots. And those, those things can be really funny. Like if somebody's hair is parted on one side and then all of a sudden in the next scene, their hair is parted on the other side. And then it keeps switching back and forth because obviously they did two takes with the two different hairs. And then they kept using bits of do two different takes. So it can be really funny. But the other thing it can be is really disorienting. Yes. And it can be really distracting. And so it's important because you're telling this story. And if you, if you do this other stuff that's really distracting where the lighting direction keeps changing every other shot and it's like this way and then this way and then this way and this way, unless, there's, unless you want that effect, unless there's a good reason for that effect, it, you're gonna have a hard time getting the audience to listen to your story because they're gonna be watching this light show that's going on being like, what's happening? And they're not gonna be paying attention to the stuff you want them to pay attention to. So that's why that stuff is really important so that you could keep telling the story you want to tell. I'm trying to remember, I was just watching a show and every shot, the character was on this side and then the next shot, the character was on this side. Then the character was on this side. Then the character was walking from this side. And then the character was, it was so disorienting, but they were very disoriented. They were freaking out about something in that moment. And so, so were we as the audience. Um, so, that kind of continuity of just what side of the screen the character is on. Um, in dialogues, if you pay close attention, they'll keep the same character on the same side of the screen as the other character. And then they switch which character's shoulder we're looking over, but they're still on that same side of the frame. Uh, and it gets really disorienting when suddenly we, we thought this character lived on this side of the frame, and then they're suddenly on the other side of the frame. In the back of our heads, it is disorienting to us. Um, there's something else I wanted to say about that as well in terms of lighting. Uh, and it's gone. Um, continuity with characters, that goes with costuming, that goes with, you know, keeping the costuming correct from scene to scene. Uh, because we may be not shooting this in order or we might be shooting in two different locations for kind of the same scene. Um, we need so, to make so sure this, that- This is really important, especially with accent items like a scarf, like the, yeah. putting the same costume on is pretty easy, but making sure your scarf is wrapped the correct direction. In um, filmmaking and in television making, this is a very important job. The person who does this is called the script supervisor and they call them scripty for short. Um, and so what uh, stage managers are gonna do this, directors are gonna do a lot of this, everybody's gonna be doing a lot of this job. A lot of the actors are gonna have to do a lot of their own script supervising, but wherever you can, especially when it's a, a, a scene where we were brought in to do the lighting, if that's necessary, because I don't think it's gonna be necessary for every scene that you do. But for the ones where it's necessary, that means we need to keep track of 
you know, measurements of like, okay, I got the, I got the camera this far away from this light source. And then the actor was standing this far away from both of them so that you can recreate it. That, that continuity is going to be really important. And we don't have a permanent scripty. We don't have a script supervisor. Everybody's going to be doing a little bit of that job, but it's going to be helpful if you notice something, you know, just speak up. But for costumes, it is going to be really important. Was the hat tipped this way or was it tipped this way? Because if it starts shifting in different shots, it'll, it'll get distracting again. We may want to have them take selfies before each shoot or after each shoot so that, oh yeah, in the last scene, the hat was this way. You know, just to try to keep record of each look between scenes so that the characters are able to dress themselves correctly uh, between scenes. That is good information to know. What was that, Danny? That's, oh, I was just saying that's good information to know. Yeah, I'll yeah. tell people about that. Because right. Um, uh, right now with Wild Nights, they plan to start, <sighs> Roya, do you know when they plan to start filming? I think the 19th, Isn't I heard. Monday? I mean, I have the, um, the schedule. Hold on, let me just pull it. Wow. I am a little frustrated. Oh, well, not this week, the next week, I think. Next weekend? Okay. Um, yeah. So, we're just, you know, we're um, finding costumes and stuff like that. And um, uh, we haven't gotten locations yet. And then the reason that we're a little, uh, that uh, Adriana has been a little concerned about that me too is because like if i put someone in say a predominantly green costume and then they go and film you know in a field and like a you know a grass lawn they're going to very much blend in and not stand out and so yeah how like would, a blue shoot a blue shirt on your background yeah is not gonna shoot well so like how would how would we Hold is on, there a way that mind. I, oh, no, is it right that? Danny. Yeah? Um, listen to me for a really quick second. You can go ahead and put somebody in a green costume conceptually mm -hmm. and then reach out to locations and say, hey, I'm going to put this, co this actor in green. Is that going to be, is there going to be any conflict? You could actually just ask them the question, you know, be, even though they haven't gotten the location yet. And then they can go, oh, you know what? I can make sure, I don't know where it's gonna be yet, but I can make sure it's not gonna clash with your green costume. And I'll send you pictures before we make that decision and make sure that we can work together. So, yeah. you know, just, you, there's, there's different ways around it because we're all trying to get this stuff done at the same time. So just open the lines of communication instead of just being frustrated and waiting and not doing well, the work. So, just find a way to get that work done. So one of the things that I was told is that, no, that doesn't matter. Um, I was told that costumes would not affect location and that like location won't affect costumes. And I've been told multiple well, times that that's- Well, they, it's, it's they just going to for our production. For our production, we're just gonna have to try to get things done on the time schedule that we've been given and work, work with what we've got. So that might not, not be the way that they do it, you know, in some places, but it's gonna be maybe the way that we do it here and now, because we gotta work with the resources that we've got on the schedule we've got, you know, so yeah. just, so I think, you know, if there, and if there are, if you are frustrated and feeling like you can't move forward, just, you know, let's open the lines of communication and figure out what we can do to move well, forward. So, so what my question is, is there a way that I can like, like use costumes and sort of, I guess sort of like, how can I interact with costumes and lighting? Like, how can I make a blue costume stand out with a blue black background? Something over the shoulders, a tie, something else. <laughs> just the lighting can do it. Like, yeah. the, because there's gonna be some difference. Right now, Peter's wearing a black shirt on a black background, but do you still see where the line of his shoulders are? And if you wanted to emphasize him and try to pop him out more from that black, from that background, you backlight him backlight. and give him that little silhouette halo right around it, which can actually be really, you know, it could be ominous, it could be really magical, it could be, you know, a little otherworldly. Um, you, you know, you could actually just put a practical light source that's back there that you're seeing. Um, practical light source, does everyone know that term practical when we're talking film and television? And you know what I mean when I say practical? Mason, you know, what is it? 
Um, I'm guessing it just means like, well, just taking it practical. I mean, it's probably easy to do just like seal the lights or something like that. Mason, your mic is mad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah you kind of sound like a robot and not one that we, we know the language of. I'm sorry. <laughs> But it means, <laughs> but it, but a practical, a practical anything in film and television. I mean, it's, if there's a telephone that rings, the ringing actually comes from that phone. It's not a sound effect that's playing over the speakers over here. The phone is actually ringing, and then someone picks it up. And a practical light source would mean we see the fact that there is a lamp there. Actually, the lamp, the side lamp on the table is in the scene, and it's on. That is a practical light source. So we're not trying to hide the fact that that is a light source, it's a for real thing. But we could also put something like that in the shot and, and shine that light right on Peter and that would also break him out from that background. There's all kinds of solutions. Um, maybe there is a really cool effect you could have of actually impurposefully camouflaging the actor against the background and then have them walk into a light where then they're revealed against it. Just because just because there are challenges doesn't mean you can come up with then a very creative solution if by chance you designed a blue costume and locations designed a blue background, maybe you could still find a super awesome way to make it work. There's, there's all kinds of solutions to, to problems like that. So it's, it's, gonna, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be challenging for all of us and all of us are trying to learn a new thing, but I wouldn't have the fact that locations hasn't finished their work yet stop you from your work. You should just go ahead and forge ahead. And if you have a question about it or a concern about it, reach out to locations and be like, this is what I want to do. I, I'm worried there's going to be a conflict. And then we can, I bet you, uh, bet you almost anything, we can work it out. There's not well, going to be very many things where you're going to have to change your costume because of locations. Frustration with locations. Um, I'm, don't at all fault them. Like they're doing great. It is more of a, it is more of a frustration with just like communication and then how deadlines are being set two days before they're due. And like that, and that, and that was, and that's just what's frustrating is that we've all been continuously getting caught off guard. And so we're well, trying to so kind of speed and figure things out. I, I think that then that's also thing, a thing to just bring up instead of letting it stop you from your work being like, Hey, this is making it difficult. What can we do? Like, find the way forward is, is what you need to do. So, you know, you know, talk, talk to people and keep the communication open. That's the, that is the way to, um, to solve those things. And also making sure that you're doing the things that other people need right now, you know, because um, for example, no one is showing up to rehearsals. I know that everybody in every department has supposed to be going to rehearsals. So like, at least you can do those parts. There are parts of our job that we all can do that we've kind of not been doing. So we can at least, we can at least jump on with the things that we know that have been on our to-do list that we haven't done yet. And, 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 and then also, if there are communication issues or deadline or scheduling issues that are, that are an issue, let's address them and then figure out a solution moving forward. Don't let it stop you from doing your work. We all have this important story to tell. We got to do that. That's the most important part. So, you know, let's, let's, you know, find, find a good way forward. And this lighting stuff is important for how you think about costumes. And it's important for how locations thinks about their locations. And it's important for, you know, how editors think about the editing. And it's important for how props think about their props. It's important for everybody. But, um, and, you know, this is, this format that we're doing is new to all of us. We're all figuring it out. So, you know, let's, let's learn from it. You're learning some valuable information too. Throw, throw, your, throw your two cents into the mix, but also don't let it stop you from doing your work. A lot, a lot of the jobs that we have are still totally, we can do so many steps right now. There's so many things that we do know and that we can just jump in and do. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's, just, let's just get those things done. And there's a lot of things that translate in terms of the design aspect, especially in terms of costuming, where you want to add, you want to hide a tiny little accent, and maybe it's a, a little brooch, a pin, it's a, a ribbon that, that runs around, or the, a little choker, or little hints of color that are, are denote that character, or denote their feeling at, in that moment, or that is 
is actually telling something, some backstory that we didn't hear or we're about to hear later. So there's well, lots like, of design choices you could play with as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I have all the co my costumes. Like I, I, I finished all my costumes last night. So now we just need to start pulling things. Um, so like, I mean, I'm, it's, it's not like I'm not doing work. It is, for me though, it is more of just like a thing of like, I'm like I'm getting caught off guard and I'm getting and then communications and deadlines are going on and um well then let's then let's then let's let's try to let's try to go ahead and, and fix that let's finish up with this lecture though and do yeah. some more questions about lighting but I think I think I hear you Danny but also some of the things that we should have been doing ha still haven't been happening and that's what goes for like kind of this whole this whole process it's been hard to get started and it's been hard to get all the information but you still need to go to rehearsals. Everyone needs to go to rehearsals. Mm -hmm. But let's, um, let's go ahead and finish up this, this lighting thing. We have Peter here with us and let's talk more about this stuff later. And let's, let's find good ways forward. Especially in rehearsals, if we are actually seeing many of the locations, um, if those are able to happen in rehearsals, like in their houses, in their rooms, in their kitchens, or if we can see some of these, I'm, I'm looking at Roya's background, um, which is, it has such wonderful depth to it, right? When we can see much more versus a background like Danny is just up against a wall. There's so much more interest in having that depth and that angle and seeing more lines. Um, in, in, this is a little more about composition and how you wanna shoot it, but it also has to do with lighting, is you wanna, you wanna look at a location in terms of the lines that we see in it. Uh, Charlotte Walbers, uh, the lines behind her, uh, almost if, if she were shifted over a little bit to your right, the lines in the wall would be directing us toward you. So even, you know, not your camera, but yourself if you scooted over to your right. Yeah, see how then we've got leading lines that are leading us and our eyes to look at the subject. And it's also usually much more interesting to be in a different part of the frame than just dead center, right? So that with Charlotte Walber over there is, is a much more interesting and better composed shot. The line of the couch, the lines from up above, all converging there. Um, Mason has this Godfather style shot. Uh, if we got, if I'd, I'd want a shower curtain on the outside of those windows or something to just diffuse that light and just keep it from being so distracting or a white curtain in front of it. But that is just wonderful angle of like, I am in charge of the world, right? Um, so there's a lot you can do with the lighting and the camera angle to, to tell a lot about a character and about a situation and a scene. So think about those as you're designing um, and, and working with a location. Uh, Liam's lighting is definitely way too dark. He's got all this light behind him. So if there were a way to turn that around and use that light that's coming in those beautiful windows behind him um, or get him closer and sitting with that light coming in from the side instead of right behind him. Uh, and Rosie's black screen there gives this ominous black screen. <laughs> okay, other, <laughs> other questions or uh, situations that you, you wonder might be an issue or, or how to solve or how to plan ahead? What if are you're the shooting things? something, sorry. Go ahead, Charlie. If you're shooting something in like, the evening or like nighttime and it's supposed to be dark how do you light that in the way that it's like still dark what what do you what have you noticed in films for night scenes what do you think what tells you it's nighttime i guess like anybody if there's like a window that's dark but dark window Maybe. The light's blue. It's blue. Oh. I don't know why, but when it's nighttime, it's blue. Oh, okay. 
when you'll see, you'll notice it now, you'll see it everywhere. You'll, you'll see it in movies and everything you're watching. They turn out the light to say goodnight to the child. And so this beautiful warm light, they turn off the bedroom light and then it's blue with this nice white light going across them from the window. So instead of there not being light, we just color that light blue and suddenly okay. it is nighttime. In a camera, in a DSLR, you can set the, the white balance. The white balance can be much warmer and you can set it to be really warm and it's all about the color temperature. Or you can set it to be really cold and then it stands, ends up looking blue. So we shoot day for night and we just color it blue. And there's actually a ton of light. But because it's blue, our head is thinking, oh, it must be nighttime. And then if it's quiet outside or we hear some crickets or frogs or the, they're colder, they're acting like it's nighttime. Things you act as if it is quieter, uh, nighttime sounds and nighttime temperatures. There are things that we do to act like it's nighttime, but for the lighting aspects, we make it blue. <laughs> But that is a great question, and it makes a big difference and should be in all of your notes about all of your shots. What time of day is it? Are we indoors or are we outdoors? And what time of day is it? These are very, very important questions that inform your whole everything that you set up. Should be two of your major notes that you take about everything. You can also think about season, like what, what, what is it like outside? Uh, in winter when if it's a snowy environment your light is bounced everywhere because of that snow and so there are these weird lights that come from below in the winter time um, and in summertime you've got that harsh up uh, the sun is higher up in the sky in the summertime so if you've got summertime light it will be much more direct from above so you may want to just bounce a lot more light in there But yeah, yep, time, time of year is going to make a big difference. We're doing some we're doing some shots in that first show that we need to go from some from spring to winter, all within the span of like the same story. Excellent. How are we gonna how how are we gonna change the lighting for spring and summer and winter? It makes a big difference for that giant story. So like how how do we how do we dress that up? How do we dress up our our actors to change to change that? You know, like the. The, the costumes and the props and the lighting, that's where it all comes together where we can get really warm and wonderful and spring and wonderful songs and music and dancing and playing. And then those really harsh winter scenes where everything is pretty sad and pretty miserable. And we so need to get that contrast happening. Cloudy skies, so it's gonna be diffused soft lighting. And you're gonna have long shadows because the sun is lower in the sky and you get these long, beautiful winter shadows and probably a bluish tint. All right, do we, do we have any other questions? We've got, we've got Peter here right now. Right now is the time to have your questions. Mason, what you, you, just, you just had that wonderful idea for that shot in um, the rehearsal that you just went to. Do you, got any, do you got any questions about it while you've got Peter here? Well, all right then. If, um, you, I, if you are in I, charge of lighting, I encourage you to experiment with light. Get into a dark closet with a flashlight and other things that are plastic that you can shine light through that are colored, that are textured, and just play with the quality of light in a dark space and one light source and maybe a white piece of paper to bounce it around. Roya. Oh, I just have a question about earlier on, you said that um, you have a canvas document with a bunch of different light sources. Uh, where would the link to that be? that address right now. I will oh, if you could just paste it in the chat, that would be perfect. I will paste it in the Thank chat. Thank you, Peter. Yes. Thank you so much. This has been fun. Yeah, and I've there's some been great sources this. on there. 
I've been sharing this all around the county. Uh, <laughs> other and, um, and this is in the eighth period folder, as well as the recording to the workshop that Peter did before. Oh. And, and we'll get this, this, this um, recording up in there as well, in case you want to watch it again, or if somebody else in your department wants to come back and watch this workshop from today. Oh, um, that's right. You, you did totally say that it was in the folder. My bad. Great. So that's okay. Um, it's also in the Wild Nights folder, and I haven't uploaded it yet to um, the Noise folder, but it will be in there. So it'll be like, it's pretty ubiquitous, and it should be pretty easy to find, but also just feel free to reach out if you're having a hard time finding any of those links or navigating those folders. Just make sure that, you know, don't, don't not do the work and do the research and look at Peter's resources because you're like, I couldn't find the folder. You know, there's a lot of people you can ask. So just... Make sure you actually do the work. I would much rather it be posted 19 times than be hard to find. So, this is and uh, the, the, the one that, that Peter did on some of the film terminology is also a really fun one to watch. We're doing a lot of theatrical aspects too. We're not just purely making film, we're also still kind of doing plays. We're doing a weird mashup, but it's also really fun to just kind of read the different slightly different jargon and different ways of thinking about things. So that one is really fun to use, to read as well, as well as useful, because we really have kind of switched to some of those terms. So um, I, I do suggest just checking that one out as well. Cool. Great, I hope this has been helpful to everybody. And I am always available via email, pparish at tamdistrict.org or just shout at Ben and he'll, he'll pull me in somehow. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.